You are listening to Humanities Engaged, where we take a closer look at the value of a liberal arts education. I'm Steve McFarlane, and I teach philosophy in the Division of Humanities at the University of Minnesota Morris. I'm joined by UMM student and brains of the operation, Adam Kretz. Say hi, Adam. Hey there, everybody. Thank you for listening. You'll hear me chime in occasionally during the interview with a couple questions, and I'll join Steve afterwards to discuss what we learned. We are coming to you from the University of Minnesota Morris, made possible with funding from the Mellon Foundation. Please join us as we interview UMM faculty to learn how they teach and why they teach. Today's guest is Dr. Jennifer Dean. Professor Jennifer Dean is a member of the History Department in the Social Sciences Division. Professor Dean received her PhD from Northwestern University. She is a recipient of the Alumni Association Teaching Award and the Horace T. Morse Minnesota Alumni Association Award. She is also the author of the book, A History of Medieval Heresy and Inquisition. We bring you now to our interview. So how did you get into um, your field of study history? History and uh, maybe medieval history history? in particular. Uh, I get that question a lot when I introduce myself and say Mm -hmm. what I do and kind of this uh, expression of like, huh, how how would that happen? So Hmm. the background on that is that I was lucky enough to be raised um, in a family with a lot of books. And uh, my father in particular loved reading history. He also read a lot of philosophy, you'll be glad to know. Okay. Um, He was a writer. And and so we just grew up, my sister and I grew up with all of these wonderful historical texts on our bookshelves. And I think there's something to be said for um, growing up in the presence of books, Mm -hmm. you know, the the material objects themselves. And Mm -hmm. so Um, We did a lot of reading, and I was originally going to go into science, like a lot of students. I was going to do pre-med and uh, hit chemistry and quickly rethought that (laughs) approach. And I had a conversation with my dad one day where I said, you know, what I'm really enjoying are my history classes right now. They were U.S. history. I said, Mm -hmm. I just, I, I get this. It's so interesting and fun. And he said, well, you know, you can major in that, right, which I hadn't known up to that point. I see. Um, And then the other piece of it is that I had really marvelous teachers in the medieval and early modern field, and they just captivated me. So do you think that having those teachers launched you into medieval history, or do you think you would have got there anyway? That's a good question. Question: mm. I, I, know. I would have to do a little. <laughs> I would have to do a little research and think about how okay. that would all play out. Yeah. Um, I think it definitely had to do with teachers. I had um, Robin Chapman Stacy at the University of Washington, and I will never forget her early lectures, um, kind of the intro to medieval history course, and she was talking about power disputes between these two feuding queens and um, the strategies they developed. And I, she just had a way of making the material matter. Yeah. And I was, I was stuck now, from that. Yeah, now yeah. you're still doing mm-hmm. it. So, so what are some uh, one or two important questions that you're researching or um, mm-hmm. areas of interest? My m- main field of research is late medieval religious history. And so by late medieval, that's roughly the um, 13th, 14th, 15th centuries. And I focus pretty much on continental Europe, um, Germany in particular. And so broadly speaking, I'm really interested in what seem to be oppositions, and particularly these oppositions present in the sources from the late medieval period, for example, heresy and orthodoxy, right? You know, right belief and wrong belief, or lay people versus clergy, or um, you know, any any number of other kinds of oppositions. And my research is all about the middle ground between those. It turns out that those two that are always presented in opposition, Christian versus Jewish is another example, or Christian versus Islam, uh, Christianity versus Islam. Um, there are all kinds of middle areas uh, linking the two. And so my research has to do with um, how medieval people thought about their place in those structures. Specifically, uh, the research project I'm finishing right now has to do with women's communities in medieval Germany that were right in the middle between secular and religious. Mm -hmm. And 
um, very much embedded in local communities, um, that they're difficult to find in the source material because everybody wants to talk about it in that era as they were either nuns or they were secular yeah. women. Yeah. So I'm interested in that comp in those more complicated areas. And then do you find it echoes uh, into the contemporary times with those mm -hmm. kinds of questions? Sure. Yeah, yeah it's, um, it's pretty much impossible, I think, to escape the fact that the questions that historians asked are shaped by our own time, right? Mm. We're, not, we're not separate from our own context. And mm. so um, not surprisingly, about 15 years ago, medievalists started to notice networks <laughs> In yeah. the medieval past, or to talk about mm -hmm. technologies mm -hmm. and um, you know gender, for example, and so yeah, absolutely. As um, our own context changes, it doesn't shape our findings because we have really strong, clear methodology to try to make sure it's not simply about opinion. Mm -hmm. um, but certain questions come to see more seem more significant. Um, right now, for example, migration and movement. Yeah. A lot of people are talking about that in the Middle Ages or race or disease and so forth. And in particular with um, these findings you have about the role of religion in, in the time for women in particular, are you finding the complexity you're finding there in are the attitudes, would they be familiar to us or they be unfamiliar to us now, do you think? Some of the attitudes would be quite unfamiliar. When I teach this material to students, it, it's kind of wonderful to see. Um, they're often quite surprised by the very stark um, misogyny of the, so for example, clerical texts um, from the early and, and high and even later Middle Ages, and the assumptions of um, you know, a very clear hierarchy between the sexes, very clear, undisputed kinds of arguments about what made women lesser than men and, and so forth. And it's a fascinating history. Do you, do you have examples that, you, you know, something that comes to mind on that front? Oh, well, sure. I mean, from so the, the early medieval West inherited the Aristotelian notion, right? So Greco-Roman traditions were passed on through the early Middle Ages, and in particular, the Aristotelian notion of the hierarchy of the sexes. So again, one of these sort of binaries that it's men versus women, except in this case, it's very clearly men superior, women inferior, and in fact, the argument that women were simply a deformed version of men. And along with that, then over the centuries, that becomes a very powerful and useful idea for constructing knowledge, for channeling power, for um, thinking about the relationship between people. And so there's a lot of really vivid language all the way from you know, the early medieval um, up through the later centuries about you know, the w women are worse than you know, the, the sort of lowest animal and becoming linked to um, scripture, certainly, um, yeah. linked to um, the condition of humanity and having been responsible for eating the apple and so forth. So it, it's a fascinating history and a fascinating study in the development of not just rhetoric, but the powerful concrete ways in which rhetoric relates to what is possible and impossible at the time. Yeah. To come back to your earlier question about this, I think there is a big difference between the theoretical or the you know highly kind of um, textual and, and, and abstract, mostly written material, and then lived experience on the ground. So kind of the theoretical versus the sociological. Mm -hmm. And I think very often on the ground, people are operating in a quite different way. And that's what mm. my research uh, is interested in. And then I suppose uh, from, you know, looking at from the angle of this religious institutions, the clergy are super influenced by the um, education that's been passed down through, which, which, which has been not accessible to other groups at the time, right? right. So they would have adopted the teachings of Aristotle through Aquinas and so on all the way. And other people would not have, had access to that, but have viewed these people as the educated people That's who right. know better. Is That's that right. The well, yeah, the cler uh, clergy had an extremely important role, particularly as um, from about the 11th century on, the medieval West really 
boomed, boomed in economic terms, and in, you know, this is the era of cathedrals and of uh, the u universities. So mm -hmm. what you're talking about there, anybody who went to the university um, was a member of the clergy, and so many of the elements that we recognize today in universities derive from exactly that model, even the language of chancellor and provost and dean and the gowns and so <laughs> forth is specifically medieval. Mm -hmm. um, people would have heard clergy speak in sermons, you know, drawing on old familiar images. There are texts, um, one of my favorite texts to teach with is a, it's actually an early medieval um, penitential. That is, it's a collection of the penances that should be assigned for different kinds of sins um, compiled, so it's sort of a um, best practices, I guess, of, right. of the medieval era, and boy, that is fascinating material. Everything, every possible sin you could imagine, many, most students are kind of aghast at what they had come up with to consider, right. and it tells us a lot about the society and the relationship between the sexes. Yeah, so speaking of... Um class that you know you, you teach the, you assign that reading in class what are some other ways you think about structuring your classes is there s you know some classes lend themselves to this some don't mm -hmm. uh, kind of progression where you need to know this before you can know that or is it set up like modular units you just break up we do this for four weeks we do this four weeks right. or how, how do you think about your think about your classes either generally or specific class i would say that maybe the definitive um purpose of a syllabus for me is making very clear why we are moving from one to the next. So historians, uh, we love our chronology and <laughs> sequence and um, the idea of starting later, I, my head can't handle it, I, it, would, it would blow up. And so I'm very, very intentional about my syllabi because the process of, of constructing it lets me know what are we going to be doing and why? Whereas, so even the question of where does this class begin, I usually talk about that on the first day of the class. So for example, in my course on the Crusades, we don't begin with the first crusade in the late 11th century. We begin much, much earlier. Mm -hmm. And I you know, usually ask, well, why? Why are we doing this? You know, my medieval Europe class, we start in the late Roman period. Um, and if you ask a historian a question or say, when did this begin? We typically will say, well, there's an interesting sort of backstory to right. it. And that's fundamental to historical thought. So all of my courses, and I teach broadly, it's medieval, renaissance, early modern, gender. I teach an early history of Islam and so forth. The, the purpose behind all of them is to get students thinking about causality, complexity. It's never just one thing causing another. Mm -hmm. And how to read material, whether it's a text or an object, a cartoon, a building, how to read into that what it meant to that society at the time. And so you know, most of my students are not going on to become medieval historians. And yeah. I, I don't necessarily think that the content itself is the most important thing of what I teach. It becomes mm -hmm. a really, I think, useful laboratory for giving students something very, very new that they may have some preconceptions about, and then challenging them to construct that series of questions. Well, who wrote this? And why? What are the clues? What stands out to me? And then I try to invite them in the course of the syllabus, which always develops in chronological order, but then I usually have it divided into um, by some key turning points. And mm -hmm. I try to be really clear about here's why I'm making this claim, or here's where I see the change happening. And then it can be up for discussion. Often at the end of a class, I'll ask the students to reflect on how the material was divided or the title or you know, anything else to, to take away the sense that the way I have put it together is somehow the right way. Yeah, and, and what do you find? Do they usually pick up on 
the progression as you as like you conceive of it or do you find that they're they're like oh i guess i just read this today and i i read this the next day and i just do what you tell me or is it, do you find a connection there i insist on a connection <laughs> so i think by the end of 16 weeks yeah. they know what i'm looking for yeah. in terms of the thought process mm -hmm. yeah. behind it so mm -hmm. an example would be um, my course on renaissance and reformation and um, I think it's frustrating to the students on the first day when I say, okay, what is Renaissance? What is Reformation? And we sort of push against those ideas or early modern Europe. You know, what does early mean? What does modern mean? Yeah. What does Europe mean at this point? So by the end of the semester, they're able to say that there are some challenges to how the material is divided or that one could... Um, tell a very, very different story based on, say, what if we were focusing on technological shifts? Or yeah. what if we were focusing on contact between peoples rather than religion? That, mm -hmm. that there is no single simple history. And how do you devise assignments to give? So what are the kind of tasks you give that you're hoping that students can get the most out of the class if they do this or that? So in philosophy, a lot of times we just have readings, exams, and papers. And the thought is, that's what philosophy people do all the time. So do you? how do you design your assignments to, so that students can get the most out of it? Right. Do I send them home with dusty books <laughs> to you know, <laughs> pour over? Um, I, my favorite assignment when I was an undergraduate was a kind of creative assignment that invited me to step into the role of a fictional character very much shaped by the historical context. And so it happened to be in the context of uh, 16th century Germany. And I had never encountered something like that before. And evidently, th so this is the only assignment that I remember with right. this kind of clarity. Yeah. Um, so I really took inspiration from that. I love to give students material either to discuss in class where they are free to identify whatever they find interesting about it. So I'll give you an example. Mm. One of my favorite assignments in the um, medieval survey class, uh, I'll, I'll give a text and I won't identify the author. And I'll say, okay, let's just read this for clues and keywords. And I'll say, identify, you know, mark whatever interests you or catches your eye. And mm -hmm. Um, one text is uh, praising the Emperor Justinian, and it's all about how um, marvelous his architectural feats and his wealth and his generosity and so forth. And one, one of the things that I enjoy about that assignment is that different students find different elements of the text really interesting. So one person might notice, oh, this mentions currency. I wonder mm -hmm. what that currency is. What could we learn about their units of, um, of value? Somebody else will notice, oh, the language in which the emperor is being praised suggests a very hierarchical society. And I, I really um, emphasize the point that there are no wrong answers, that yeah. you know, students find it very, very frustrating, I think, when they feel that they're supposed to read the professor's mind, you know, mm -hmm. that, that we're looking for one answer. And so we usually get a very lively discussion going, and um, it's always fun to see how much we can pull out of a single paragraph or two. And then I have them flip it around, and on the other side is a, a very different kind of text that is um, talking about the emperor in very unflattering terms, mm -hmm. you know, that he's depraved <laughs> and wicked and everybody associated with him is vile, and it's um, really wonderful language, very, very interesting to read, so we do the same thing. And then we talk about, well, what do we think about the perspective of the person who wrote this? So I don't need them to try to guess who it is, but simply what would we presume from these clues is driving this text? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the big reveal at the end of the class period is that they were written by the same person. Mm -hmm. They were written by... Um, the scholar Procopius, and the first one was written while he was working for the emperor, and right. it's kind of a PR puff piece. And then the other was from the secret history that he was writing throughout his life and planned to have published once he was safely dead. Yeah. And that's a, a fun moment because it drives home the idea that it's not about is this text true or not. It's right. 
what do we learn by paying really close attention? And I think, to come back to your question about do these things relate to the modern, absolutely. That skill, I mean, that alone, right? Mm -hmm. that, to, to read different kinds of texts and understand that there is a person behind it with with a, a motive, and I don't necessarily mean you know a, a dark motive. Simply, it takes energy to write and create or sculpt or build, and people don't do it simply because there's always yeah. something driving it. Yeah. And um, a further element of that assignment that you're mentioning towards the beginning of your answer is uh, you can give ownership to the students. Yeah. Uh, Tisha Turk, who used to teach here gave this talk recently where she said, you know, if you want students to write better in the long run, they have to take ownership of what they're mm -hmm. writing about because the only way they're going to they're continue writing. And it made me rethink, you know, how am I, are my papers giving students ownership? So it sounds like your assignments are devoted toward ownership of, of their ideas, of, of what of what catches their eye, yes. what do they want to learn more about? Yeah, I'm to put it in the simplest terms, I'm after... Um, that moment when something lights up in their eyes and they realize there's a connection between mm. something they are really interested in and the past. And so the assignments that I, uh, you know, of course I assign, you know, analytical writing and they have mm. to be able to use evidence in a certain kind of way. Um, but an idea I, I picked up from our colleague uh, Jennifer Rothschild in sociology she talks about the sociological imagination, and I've lifted that for the historical imagination. Mm. Um, so on the one hand, I'll give them assignments that um, ask them to imagine the circumstances, the environment, and they can approach that if they're interested in politics or trade or religion or family or gender, and to pursue that. I also really like giving assignments and this, it varies, you know, some classes. Um, my course on early Islamic history is a good example of this one. I have students do presentations. They research a topic pretty straightforward. Um, and I try to make sure that the material that they select is something that connects with their broader interests. So I have a lot of um, students in my classes who are not history majors. It's wonderful. It's such a mix of students all across the campus, often fulfilling their history requirement. Um, so for example, um, pre-med or, you know, chem or bio students might do a presentation on some of the incredible scientific study done during, say, for example, the um, kind of golden age in Baghdad. A uh, student interested in textiles might do something on um, uh, the, the fabric or fabric trade or art, um, architecture, and so on. I had a student once who was in chemistry and art history, I believe, do a great project on ceramics in the crusading period. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's those kinds of connections, which is fundamentally what the liberal arts are about, right? It's not about... You, you memorize content from all of these things and then somehow you're educated. It's realizing that these ideas and influences cross-pollinate, that they have been bound together um, in so many different ways. And um, I don't know if I would teach this way if I had not spent the last um, 12, 13 years on a small liberal arts campus where I get to be so inspired by, and honestly, inspired mm -hmm. by colleagues, by the conversations, by student interests. Um, so yeah, I need to keep my keep my game up. My, yeah, my question kind of runs runs uh, right with what you just said there. Yeah, because you just mentioned you have a classroom full of students and you're all looking at one text and then everybody is kind of picking up on different things, right? Depending on who they are and what they've been through, maybe who knows, right? And I, I'm just wondering if, if you've benefited from this in your own research, just having access to so many different points of view and, and the kinds of things that they notice, has it like enhanced your curiosity or, or your ability to research? And, and if so, is there some examples of, of that? That is a great question, and the answer is a resounding yes. Um, I have had every single class I teach over the course of a semester, 
even though the material is you know more or less consistent, uh, I have a completely different take on it because of what the students bring to class. Um, and I'm trying to think if I can give an example. So in my own research as well, um, I remember a conversation in an upper division course. We were doing one of these exercises. I think this was a historical methods course. And we were reading. I had given them, that's right, it was a, um, a, a, a papal bull from the 14th century that I had been working on in my research. And one of the students was reading through it and asked a question. Wait, I'm, I'm sorry, what was it, a papal bull, you said? Oh, yeah, sorry. It's a, a document, um, kind of a statement of policy from the papacy, and this bull would be circulated then. So it was kind of a um, very formal and very um, theologically binding kind of document. And uh, I had read it, you know, 1,000 times, and the student asked a question that I had never thought to ask before, and it turned out to be key to framing a chapter I was working on. So as one example, um, students' interests, for example, in um, weaponry has been wonderful. I've invited students back to do presentations on um, their own sort of collections and knowledge of medieval weaponry. I'm still hoping that um, Miles Wangenstein will build a trebuchet and bring it to class. Miles, if you're listening, you know where to find me. <laughs> Come on, Miles. Come through. <laughs> cool. Thank you. There were, um, you could, you know, snap your fingers and you would change one thing about, in your experience, how history is sometimes taught. You don't have to name names mm -hmm. of anybody or anything. There's cons a lot of constraints on teaching well and everything. But, it, but in my experience, there's things I can think of in a philosophy where I think, you know, we do too much of this or too little of that or something. Is there anything that jumps out at you as something that if you could just like rearrange things, it would, in the way that history is taught, right, specifically in, in classrooms? If you asked me that question about 20 years ago, I would have said, we do too much lecturing. Mm. Um, the, the assignments are too passive. And we're emphasizing rote learning or memorization rather than the active mental process of evaluating evidence and making claims and so forth. Um, but that really has changed a lot. And so, um, yeah, to be perfectly honest, I really enjoy how my colleagues here on this campus, certainly, and when I visit other colleagues' camp campuses and classrooms, um, I think historians these days really feel that responsibility of communicating why the past matters. And so, you know, when you have a group of people, whether it's a public audience or uh, a group of students on the first day of class looking overwhelmed by the syllabus, it's part of our responsibility to communicate why this is exciting and why it matters. Mm -hmm. So if I could snap my fingers and change something, it wouldn't be about how it, the material is taught. It would be more about how, um, broadly speaking, people think about history as the list of things that happened in the past. Yeah. And I wish I could snap my fingers and have more people understand that it's about the context that there's so many forces unfolding. And what the study of history is about is how do we, in a thoughtful and, and rigorous and compelling way, tell the stories of the past? What's a piece of advice that... Um you might give to students for your classes specifically and, and how to excel in them because you've, you've got all the details, you know, behind your desk there. And I think, I think students would benefit from hearing that. And then maybe just in general in college, what's the best way to kind of maximize your ability to get the most learning out of your time here? Hmm. I have a daughter who's just started this semester at the college. So as a matter of fact, we've been talking about exactly this. Um, the most important thing is to establish a um, connection, I think, with the faculty member. And by that, I mean simply go to office hours and introduce yourself and say something as simple as, can you suggest some 
study strategies for me. I appreciate it so much when students come in, and I understand it is nerve-wracking sometimes, especially for newer students, and the big desk and all of that is scary, but they need to remember that we are all nerds. We are all super excited about what we do, and we think it matters, and somebody taking initiative to come to our office hours, this is why we have them, doors wide open, we want students to come, I think you can pick up a lot of good information that way. Every professor is looking for slightly different kinds of analysis or approach. And so to give you the, ob or the, I shouldn't say obvious, but the piece of advice I most frequently give students for history classes is do not read the book from beginning to end, word for word. I'm not looking for that kind of mastery of detail. Um, and that is too overwhelming and it's exhausting. They don't have the time to do all of that. So I say, break it down. Write down the title of the chapter, the headings. How is the author putting this material together? Um, and then kind of looking at the subheadings and the arguments. Um, in graduate school, we called that gutting the book. But it's a very quick way of you know, starting with a framework for material and that's useful for textbooks, certainly, but I think also for any kind of um, secondary material. So find out the strategic way to pull out what that professor is emphasizing and then keep asking. Yeah, I uh, had an ancient, no, uh, history of Rome class. Roman history, I guess some people might put it. <laughs> and. Uh, I made this goal over spring break. I was going to get <laughs> ahead in the reading. I know this one. <laughs> <laughs> I still do this one. Yeah. I was going to get ahead in the reading. I was going to read every day to just get on top of things. And I remember I was I was um, studying, you know, reading about some of the emperors, um, Sully, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, I guess it was a P. P P Pompey? Pompey. Pompey. Um, within, so I read it and I was reading, trying to really get it. And then within a week I was behind, I was like right. ca caught up behind. And I don't think I was applying the strategy that you're mentioning. I was just reading and saying, okay, I hope I get the information I'm supposed to know when the time comes. Right. But you're saying plan ahead and, uh, think it, think before th reading. Yeah. And provide a scaffolding yeah. Yeah. for yourself because I mean, we've seen this, you know, thousand times students will read and and truly spend hours and hours and significant effort not always but often reading and then they'll come to class and they can't answer a question because they'll say well I, I read it last week mm -hmm. and that's pointless effort on everybody's part and so in that case the example that you gave what I would suggest would be you know, to begin with what's the time frame yeah. um, what are these headings? Are they, you know, I would suspect Roman history is often put in terms of these political transitions. Yeah. What are the, the you know, three m most significant moments of transition? Who are the names associated with those? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and kind of breaking it down from there. Um, it moves, I think, students into a much more productive place. And, um, and it's useful for any kind of research project Mm -hmm. task man project management um, I worked in the consulting field in the 90s for a while and um, that work aligned so in so many interesting ways with trying to manage a whole lot of historical information yeah so students don't make the mistake that I made <laughs> I wish I could go back that sounds like great advice it ended up um, okay <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about that um, <laughs> in terms do you have um, you, you mentioned you're not as interested in them learning, you know, this historical event, this substance, you know, like this timeline or something in, in, in a particular sense. But I suppose there's some things that you're hoping sure. if once someone leaves your class, they'll, you know, they see a movie and they can understand what that means or, mm -hmm. or you know, um, some big movement or, or even like a research question. Like right. if you were to try to learn more about this, you'd know what to look at. Is there anything like that that you can think of that you're hoping students get out of your classes? Sure. Um, 
so even as I say that the study of history is not about you know right. mastering all of the details and dates, those the the events are essentially the material we work with mm -hmm. and um, or the vocabulary that we work with. So it's really important that students do have a sense of those key dates, events, um, and the sequence of them. Mm -hmm. So as an example, um, my exams, I usually have three over the course of a semester. Um, and I, and, you know, instead of saying, you know, here, 1453, what happened in that year? Or, in, you know, in what year did um, uh, the city of Istanbul fall to mm -hmm. the invading Ottomans? I would, I give them uh, maybe five events or six events, and I ask them to put them in chronological order. And I make sure that it's not about being tricky that one is one year before the next. Right. But I want them to understand the sequence. Yeah. Um, and then I usually give them options, you know, out of the following eight, identify five of these and the significance. Mm -hmm. So um, returning to the point of student interest, that allows me to invite students to focus on what interests them. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems to work well. I think students... You know, they're not going to remember all of these, but I'm pretty sure that mm -hmm. from any given class, they probably remember, you know, a couple of the key moments. And um, I actually just got a, an email from a former student who's a um, Fulbright scholar in, in right. Germany this year, Brittany Grady, which is just wonderful. Mm -hmm. And um, she sent a, a really thoughtful reflection on how she learned in history courses here was the interconnectedness of those dates and events. Mm. And you can't ask for a better, um, that's what I'm looking for. Recommendation? Yeah, yeah. Or yeah. Something like that? It was just a wonderful um, yeah. kind of reflection of what it is that we're trying to do yeah. here. So, yeah, so I suppose if you think about it like uh, a set of dominoes, right? If you, if you couldn't, if the third domino fell first and then the first one and then the last one and right. then the fourth one, it would occur to you that that makes no sense. And so if you can't, put them in the order of like, this is the reason exactly. that the third thing happened was because the second one, but the reason the second one happened was because the first one. And that's th abstractly what you're, you're hoping that they get rather than it's not, it's not that it happened on this date. It's that this was the impetus for the next event. Occurring, exactly. I right. Mm -hmm. So then methodologically, I suppose, uh, as you've been mentioning, there's some big ideas that you're hoping they take away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So sequence, um, Causation, not correlation. So just because things happen in a particular order or at a particular moment, um, that is not n enough in itself to establish a relationship. Um, I want them to understand that everything they r read or analyze or observe from the past has a history to it in a particular point of view, and that the more of those we can pull together, the more thoughtful um, and, and it's never going to be exact, but um, a more, I'm blanking on, on what I'm trying to say here. Precise or accurate or something? Yeah, I had a student once say, it's as if we're trying to build a hologram of the past. It's never going to be exactly right but it gives us a, a sort of three-dimensional understanding. Mm. And so um, that's what we're trying to do is, is to use all of these different kinds of materials and ask really good critical questions about them and then writing, clear, <laughs> thoughtful writing that expresses clear, persuasive ideas. Again, very useful beyond yeah. the history classroom. Yeah, I mean, in philosophy, totally uh, agree with that. It's not about rhetoric, right? So it's not like this, I'm going to use this key, this important word that I learned. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes, I do. And it's <laughs> also not about expressing yourself. Those, right. are, those are valuable things. Learning words is good. Expressing yourself is good. It's about addressing an audience who might not already agree with you and getting them to see things how you see them. Mm -hmm. Through argument, Through right? Argument. Through the construction of a thoughtful and persuasive argument, which involves, I think in both of our fields, mm -hmm. acknowledging counter-arguments mm -hmm. and, and taking into consideration from the outset 
that there usually are multiple points of view, and then you have to make the argument about what makes one's own perspective compelling. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm getting a lot out of this conversation. It's a lot of interesting things I didn't know about history, and I'm just imagining for the people who might be listening to this who can't take one of your classes, but they're, they're hearing what you're saying about how to think about history, right? And I'm just wondering, you know, people looking at what's going on in the world today, is, is there anything you, would, you, you could, like, give them as, like, a way to better think about things that are going on now through the, you know, through this historical lens, you know, these ways of thinking historically? Is there anything you could give kind of to the average person? That's a big question. I, I will say that my next project um, is going to be a series of books aimed at a public audience on kind of exactly that question, sort of, because it's not always easy to find those connections. I would say um, simply knowing that everything that's unfolding today has roots in the past and that those roots are not necessarily difficult to find. You know, one of my favorite things to do when I'm encountering something that I don't know about that I'd like to know more about is, is simply going online and, you know, Googling in some keywords and looking for a recent book from an academic press in particular um, can be really useful. There are popular books, accessible books that are not filled with all that specialist language you were talking about before. Um, there are wonderful blogs and um, all kinds of materials that are becoming increasingly available. So yeah, if you have particular sources in mind, um, is there a, a um, sources that people can learn more about history or your area of history? Um, the hopefully there'll be one that's kind of in more in depth for someone who has a, uh, a start on history, and then maybe something that's accessible to a, a wider audience. Sure, one of the places I would start for material on medieval history is the website medievalists.net. And they currently have a list of um, all kinds of different podcasts. I think some of them span other time periods, as a matter of fact. Um, and again, kind of quick Googling wouldn't um, take too long to come up with a lot of materials. Mm -hmm. I also really enjoy watching some historical documentaries. Um, some of them are not useful, but some of them <laughs> are really great. And there is a series... Um, from the BBC called Time Watch. There are new um, films being produced right now, and I believe they have an archived um, collection online, and they cover all different kinds of branches of history from really kind of fun, interesting, um, and quite moving perspectives. And I think Time Watch does a nice job of bringing in both scholarly perspectives and just the the story, right? That I mean, fundamentally, history is about human beings, human beings in the past, and yeah. making that connection. Thank you again to Professor Jennifer Dean of the History Department. Adam, what did we learn today? Wow, I learned a lot. That was a, that was a real great interview for me because I haven't, I've only taken one history class in, in college thus far, and, and none here at the U yet. And one of the things that I value so much about taking philosophy as my major is I'm learning how to think philosophically. And it never occurred to me that there are, you know, that other disciplines have their own way of thinking. You know, she, she just really emphasized, you know, considering the backstory of events and, and, and what she mentioned about causality and, and just getting students to think about the complexity of, of, of history even more. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if you could speak to that, kind of maybe, I don't know, comparing philosophical thinking to historical thinking or your take on that? Well, there's going to be a lot of commonalities, right? So you want to get to the heart of a research question. And sometimes the heart of a research question has to deal with how individuals acted in a certain context or what the context was such that it would lead individuals to act in that, in that way. And so that might be like a historical version of that and, and looking at the which events lead to which. And then philosophy, you often have to make claims about what's the real cause of X or, the, or, or not. And in philosophy as well, you try to separate, you know, the kind of questions you're interested in are dependent on the context. So, for instance, if, you're, um, if there's a fire, right, when it comes to a forest fire, one of the conditions is, a spark, another condition is 
a particularly dry winter or something like that. But if you're in a metal factory, you know, working on iron ore or something like that, then sparks are the norm. So what caused the fire there was, well, how did oil or, or a, a flammable liquid end up in the factory in the, in the place where it's not supposed to? So cause, causal questions are always super context dependent and it sounds like there's a lot of overlap in how philosophers and historians would think about that. Do do you think that there are distinct ways of thinking for the historian or do you think that a philosopher and a historian they're both using rational thinking and it just manifests in mm-hmm.